Well, let's look, let's look a little closer at each one of the, of the 10 steps. So, and I know a lot of in, the folks in the room are familiar with ADDIE or the ADDIE model. <clears throat> and this kind of falls along those lines. So first we have to look at the audience. And that's very important because up till now, a lot of training has been topic-based. And so it's like, hey, I'm going to develop training on HACCP. And they develop a great HACCP training, but who is the audience? Who should take that course? Is, it, is the HACCP course designed for a regulator? Is it designed for industry? Is it designed for someone high up in industry at the management level? Or is it designed for, some, for someone who has to put a HACCP plan together? Or is it designed for someone on the floor? So these are, are um, questions that have to be asked when we look at identifying the audience. And here you see other characteristics we have to look at is the scope of their work. And so if we're designing competencies and it's not the right audience, then we could start going down that, that wrong path. And I, who, somebody had a quote about uh, if you find the wrong path, take it, or I can't remember whose quote. Oh, that was a Cheshire cat uh, from Alice in Wonderland, yep. Um, and so learning styles, personality types, so that the audience could uniquely have different needs, and so those all have to be looked at in terms of the audience uh, culture. And so I think we're going to hear a lot uh, about culture and professional culture, and sometimes agencies drive that, uh, professions can drive that. And so we have to keep that in mind if we're, gonna, uh, if we're going to develop something to address the audience need. The work environment, the tools that are available. And so there you see at the bottom some examples of a broad statement, you know, government food protection professionals. And a more specific, animal feed control officials. So I know we've seen examples recently of you know, here's some training that's good for industry and regulators. Well, then I would expect those to be a little broader because what, you know, the scope and, the, and what those two different groups do could, there may be some things that are the same, but there may be a lot of things that are different. So that training will then be different or that treatment will be different. I think the audience part's pretty self-explanatory. Second step is the competency framework. And we, uh, there's not an example on the wall of that, but I think there is, okay, there is. On the left-hand side up there, if you get a uh, chance during the break, take a look on the left-hand side. And it's, again, it has the word framework in it, so it's going to be a, a table of some sort, and it is. And it's high level, and we'll show you what we mean by that. It's, it's higher level competencies. But the competency framework, uh, and one thing that I know Lonnie wanted me to point out as well, none of these have been invented by someone here. These are things, these are scientific principles that are longstanding, and DHRD has really brought them all together into, into one process for, as, a, as a kind of a treatment for our profession. So, um, so none of these things are, are new inventions. It's that we're putting them all together now. So competency frameworks are out there, and you can look at a number of competency frameworks if you go to the internet. I know CDC's got a number of those. But again, it serves just as the curriculum framework does, as a vision. So that's why it's at the broad, high level. You start out, what is it that we want people in this profession to know or do? But let's look at the parts. Well, first of all, the purpose. And I mentioned that already, that the purpose of it is to Identify the desired outcomes at the high level. And this is what we are going to measure against, are these uh, behaviors or outcomes. They have to be, and we'll repeat this over and over throughout the next two days, competencies have to be observable and measurable. And we'll show you how you get to that. And evaluation is going to take place, as, as, as you all are aware of the ADDIE model. Evaluation needs to take place, and reassessment needs to take place. Uh, continuously. So just as with the curriculum framework, competency frameworks have um, a structure to them. At the top we have broad groupings called domains and in the case of 
the competency framework for food protection professionals. Um, you'll see things like communication, technical uh, domains, leadership domains, and you'll see all the domains listed on the, uh, on the framework and in your book. And just, uh, again, like the curricul curriculum framework at different levels, so, and these levels match the curriculum framework. So entry level, advanced level, technical specialist level, leadership level. And there's competencies again. So to, there's a real um, process involved in identifying competency statements. So when we talk about competencies, we can talk about competencies in general as knowledge, skills, abilities, attitudes, behaviors, beliefs. Uh, or, and then in this case though, because we want something that's measurable, we have to follow a set of rules and we have to put them in a statement. So uh, and I know uh, uh, it includes the set of uh, skills, knowledge, abilities, and so in the statement we're going to say whether that's something you want them to know or do. So let's look at a statement a little closer. It has to be observable and measurable. So I know one thing that if for all of you who've been in this process um, and we use a term like understand, is that a good competency verb? And I've seen a lot of heads shake, no, because they've been, it's been drilled into them. That's perhaps not, a, can you measure understanding? And people, somebody said yes, and maybe, you, maybe there's a way to get at that, an attribute or a attributed model, but um, it's a lot easier to be able to write these in action verbs. And with the, for that, we tend to use Bloom's list. And who, how many are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Yeah, most people in the room. And so as you all know, when you get your Bloom's list, when we identify what is it we want them to know or do, and now let's put a verb in front of that. We go to the Bloom's list and look for a good action word that we can measure. So it may be explain, discuss, describe, identify. It has to refer to a specific knowledge and must refer to a specific job and that's where we identified that audience and level and perhaps even a professional track. Sample competency statements. So under the personal safety uh, um, content area, we may have a broad competency that says choose safe practices based on assessment of risk. So we've got our action verb choose, and that kind of implies how would we measure choose? And it, say it was we developed a course. Well, the people developing the course could put a, um, some exercise in the course where someone in the course would need to choose or look at a list or look at a visual or, or pick from a grouping. So there is a way to do that and see if they do it correctly because, and that gets toward assessment. So there's ways of assessing whether they can choose. So the next narrower competency that would build on that would be articulate actions taken to address personal safety concerns. So it's still kind of high level, but we're using the action word. You know, can someone stand up and be called on and articulate those, those uh, actions? And then maybe a little more specific, a level four, might be describe chemical safety hazards. So now we're getting a little more specific. There's a process that, uh, that takes place to get more and more specific as we drill down, but that all build on the higher level competency. So here is the competency framework. There's the domains at the top, communication, core competencies, critical thinking competencies, organizational awareness, and technical. Those are the domains and then our, our four um, professional levels on the side. And remember again, this takes place before we put the curriculum framework together. So if we look at one box on here, technical specialist and then technical domain, and populate that, and no one in the back can read that, so therefore we pop that up. So in that particular box it may say, here are your high level competencies for technical specialists in the technical domain, recommend agency food safety policy, 
coordinate courses of action based on subject matter knowledge, recommend courses of action based on, uh, I think that says, oh, coordinate and then recommend, evaluate. So you see this may be someone more at the policy level, so either here in FDA would be CIFSAN or someone in uh, CFIA may be the policy branch. So that may be someone at a technical level uh, with a technical domain may uh, be part of their competencies. So that's just an example. Does that make sense? Okay. So then here's the competency framework filled out at those high level competencies. Now remember, we'll start drilling down on those at a later step, but this starts the process. From this, the group then can start identifying the curriculum framework content areas. So we start with the high level things we want people to know or do that we can measure. So that's the competency framework. Step three, so we've got audience, competency framework, now we're going to develop the curriculum framework. So we've talked a lot about the curriculum framework already. So we talked about the content areas, professional levels, professional tracks, and specific program areas. So we'll, there's the framework. We have talked about that all morning. The thing to remember too though, uh, you know, so this is the main, what we're calling the main framework. A number of other frameworks uh, are being worked on or have been worked on and are continuing to be worked on that are kind of subsets or standalone. Um, I mentioned the one from Office of International Programs. Uh, uh, comp uh, curriculum framework has, and competency framework has been put together for global food medical product regulators. And then there's been a lot of work done on the animal feed curriculum frame, competency and curriculum framework for animal feed. And in fact, now the animal feed framework is a subset of the main framework. State laboratory professionals, Yvonne's back there, and Ron Klein is somewhere around here. There he is. And they've been working with APHL and AFCO and AFDO on uh, state laboratory professionals curriculum framework. So they've done the same steps. They've done a uh, competency framework. They've been working on the curriculum framework and they've now working and drilling down on all the competencies. And there's also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of interest at the community college and, and um, university level. So there's been some work done on food safety essentials for a college course. And I don't have CFIA, CFIA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, has done a number of frameworks as well for their inspectorate, for their policy branch, their science branch, and those are the three. Okay. All right. Are we having fun? I'm doing a lot of talking, so <laughs> any questions? I'm starting to see some eyes after lunch here. If you need to go out and get a coffee, is there still coffee out there? Okay, so you won't hurt my feelings if you stand up and get a cup of coffee. But I think there is a break at, uh, when is the next break? Four o'clock? <laughs> okay, put another pot on. All right, competency statements. So let's look at the curriculum framework content areas. Um, Remember, we've done our high-level competencies in the competency framework. Now, we're want, uh, now the next step is after the curriculum framework, we're looking at competency statements within these content areas where we're going to start doing our drill down. Remember, broad and overarching, and then we have our narrow competencies. Then we have specific competencies. That's kind of what we're terming them, and as I said, really some of the more specific competencies almost get to the point of learning objectives. Okay, so we've, and we started with this example of personal safety, so we're going to continue with this example in this content area. It happens to be at the entry level. So let's look at some examples. A broad overarching competency, choose safe practices based on assessment of risk. So remember we have that in, tar in the curriculum framework, or on the competency framework. 
But now we want to get a little more narrow. So articulate actions to address personal safety, use knowledge to address personal safety concerns, evaluate conditions to identify personal safety concerns, recognize safety policies. So a little bit more narrow. Then we take each one of those and get even more specific. Explain how personal safety is achieved by following agency safety policies. Describe chemical safety hazards. Describe equipment related safety hazards. So you can see um, there's a process to get and uh, drill down further and further. And we'll talk in a second. That second chart on the wall uh, from the left is an example of how that drill down takes place. And a lot of folks in this room have been part of those drill downs, and they're probably tired of, of this process, but it, uh, it really does achieve narrow competencies. Okay, this is step four. So we remember, we, so now we've done the audience, we've looked at the competency framework, we've looked at the curriculum framework and put all that together, and now we're gonna be developing these broad competencies. We've talked about that. So we use this chart, and that you see that chart up on the wall, to look at the content area under title. There's the content area on the framework. A definition is developed for that broad competency. Participants will be able to do what? Determine if retail food operations result in unadulterated products. So that's a broad competency. Objectives, and remember we talked about terminal objectives or learning, enabling learning objectives. So here are more specific. Once they come up with that higher level, that might be level two, and now we want level three more specific to that, that particular competency statement. Let me check in with my chauffeur. How are we doing? Okay. All right. The next step, and we do give these separate steps in this 10-step process, are the narrow competencies. So these are sub-competencies. So there's KSAs. So we're going to look at uh, labeling, food prep processes, intended use of product, under labeling, these uh, sub-areas. And we'll look at an example of that. So how do we do the narrow competency? Well, same approach. Oops, here it is. So in this particular sub-competency, labeling. Now what's the goal of that? Describe labeling requirements. How do we do that? Well, we identify the components on the nutrition panel, describe allergen labeling requirements, discuss health claims, identify the components of principal display panel. So you see that's a lot more narrow than a lot of the higher level competencies we've been talking about. And we would do the same thing with what about food preparation processes? What about determining intended use? What about determining intended customer? What about health risks? Same thing. What do we want them to do? How will they do it? That's how we kind of keep narrowing it down. Okay? All right, we're done with competencies. <laughs> so you can wake up. <laughs> The next step in the process, six out of ten, we've only got four to go here, <laughs> our planning documents. So now the uh, next step is to actually start putting these documents together, the blueprints. Remember we talked about the blueprints. We're going to hand these blueprints over to somebody to be able to go ahead and design the learning and then to develop the, the learning. So now we want a standardized way to develop a planning document. And so this process lends itself really well to DHRD because uh, by managing this process, putting the planning document together, it can essentially then turn that over to any, uh, and rather than have it linear, they can have, you know, as they do now, six, six grantees that they can, you know, pick one and hand this over and say, hey, Rance, go have Neha develop this. So, and now we know Neha will develop it according to the plan. So the question is, is this the point at which we're now done with committees and the contractors are doing their job? And I think, so looking at what the process we're going through right now with the gen eds, yes. So we've got, we've had a number of, um, of regulators at the state, local, federal level who've been meeting, have been developing these broad and, and narrow competencies. 
been putting these frameworks together, have all the competency statements. Now we're at a point where we can put a planning document together, and you're right, turn it over to anybody, to the agency, to FDA, to a state, to GMA, to whoever, and say, hey, here's the plan, can you go develop this? Because remember, we have a check and balance in place to make sure they develop it according to the plan. So, the program alignment planning document, sequencing is important because, um, you know, you're not going to want to take some advanced course or, or look at some advanced competencies until you, if and until you've had some preliminary prerequisites. Did someone find this in the, uh, is it in the uh, appendix? It's in the presentation. Oh, okay. So we'll see an example of it in the slides. So it is in your book. And then another document is the content area topic alignment planning document. And it aligns the objectives within a content area. So personal safety or labeling or whatever the content area is, this aligns the uh, specific objectives within that. And so these two documents become the blueprints and again are turned over then to whoever you want to turn it over to, to develop the course. So this is an example of the program alignment planning document, right? That is the content area. That's the content area, <laughs> okay. But you can see that it has very narrow competencies over here. And so a subject matter expert might look at that and say, oh, okay, now I know what I need to write about when I develop this course. So documentation is important. We're asking industry to do a lot of documentation now with FISMA, so we should do the same as well with, with uh, learning development. Oh. Course overview, overarching goals, and High level objectives. So there's your level, so let's say level th three, right? So those are the broads, broad statements. And then subtopics within those broad statements, which come out of that whole discussion. And then now we identify goals, which are level four for those specific subtopics. And that becomes our level four competencies and then our level five competencies. In some cases, we've gone down to level six and seven. Not always, because we just, if it runs out at level, if you can't really say anything more about it or, or want to see any more uh, knowledge or, or skill after level five, or, uh, then, it, there's, then it stops there. Okay. And so that's that program area planning document. So the, that con content area document, you saw it really had all the competencies in it. And now we're looking at a um, title. Oh, I see. And here we have 2000, 2010, 2020, 2030 levels. Fellowship. Oh, this happens to come from a course, a fellowship course. has different modules and almost courses within a program. So this is actually a program. The description of each, the scope, the goal, the objectives. And a lot of folks are familiar with you know, this really just becomes your terminal on enabling learning objectives. So that's really what this is. A lot of you already do that as, as program developers. Now we get the, the design. So we've got those documents. Those are the blueprints. Now we're going to be um, designing. And so that's very important when we talk about, I know you've heard that DHRD has a lot of ISSs or instruct, I think they're instructional design. Instructional systems. Uh, instructional systems specialists and some some organizations call them instructional systems designers and so whatever you want to call them uh, these are the folks that say okay here's the competencies here's the planning documents is it a course is it something else how are, what are we going to design to address those what's going to be the design elements and so this is this is the important step where it may not be training it may be something else. It may be a, a job aid. 
It may be that simple, but, or it may be a combination of all of those things. So the design stage is really important. And again, when these are assessed, we're going to assess whether this design step happened. So the use of these, uh, oh, to do this, you, you're going to you use those two planning documents. But the product here is a design document. So this stage really develops what's called the design document. So a group of SMEs really can't do much until they are handed a design document. Oh, yeah, this one drops off. So that was the design, and, and look at the teams. The teams really are made up of the same people. Instructional designers, subject matter experts, peer reviewers, and project managers. So they're on the design team, and those same folks can be on the development team, or it could be a different set of folks. They're, uh, in the development stage, they're going to use those the program document, the course alignment planning document. They're going to use the design document now that the designers put together. And they're going to follow design standards. And this is something DHRD has been working on um, tremendously recently, is to put these standards in place for how we want uh, consistent designs and for all these stages. And so DHRD is developing standards for the design and so that we can go back and evaluate these and we can place them. We want to make sure it has consistent documentation or design. So the product of the development team now is going to be the learning event materials and that's what we called it. So it may not be training. It could be, and it could be plural. It could be a combination of things. Training, job aids, education, standardization, coaching. So we're almost there. Hold on, now we're on step nine. So quality review. So we have to have a step to make sure we've done everything correctly before we say it's, it's good. So now we have a step where we put together a peer review panel. We make sure that panel has access to the alignment documents, the design documents, the content that's been developed, they look at the design and development process and the documentation that took place during design and development. They look at the materials that have been developed, the, whether it's the course itself or the job aid or whatever it is. They then look at the instructional methodology. So that's a step in there in terms of the design document that is, okay, um, is this more knowledge-based? Is it more uh, skills-based? Is it, uh, what is the modality? Is, does the modality match the design of, of what you're trying to accomplish. Is it blended learning? Is it online? Is it face-to-face? -face? Is it training? Is it, it doing an assessment in the field? So that's what the peer review panel will look at. And they'll see where the overall fit is within the curriculum framework. They'll be looking at the competencies framework, the curriculum framework, and saying, where does this fit now? And where are we going to place it in the curriculum? And that's the stage we're at. We place it in the curriculum. It, once it's placed, we have assurance that it meets those requirements for its intended use. It goes into a content area. It's given a prefix. F DHRD will give it a prefix and a number and, and um, give it its Dewey Decimal System. Sequence it in the targeted audience. Can you think of something that may be impacted when all this happens, when we look at the program standards. So if we look at standard two in the program standards, in ter especially in terms of sequencing, we may think in the future we may need to look at standard two and, and see how this impacts standard two. And then, it, to Brian's point earlier, we want to then place it in a catalog of some sort. And especially if it's open source. I'll show you an example of that. And it's available. It's available for delivery. After that, the delivery takes place and there's a, as I think someone mentioned earlier, there's a whole host of things we need to overcome now for delivery. If it is instructor-led, how do we make sure it's affordable and how do we get it to everybody that needs it, especially if you have a state that you can't travel out of. 
So this is going to be a challenge, and it's going to be a resource challenge as well to figure out how we get it. Obviously, a lot of the knowledge-based things are going to be um, good to put on a uh, learning management system and have people take those on, online. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at something here. So to the question that came up earlier, um, can we look at this a little closer? And the answer is yes. So what has been developed is an online interactive framework. And so I mentioned that at any point in time, if you want to see the latest framework or the latest iteration or the latest competencies or subcompetencies for any area, you can go online. So what I want to point out on this slide, though, is um, something I'm going to show you. So we're going to walk, I'll show you this on the internet right now. Um, Brian earlier mentioned course catalog. So I'm going to show you a feature about submitting courses and course submission by service providers. So let's take a look at the interactive framework. So I'm going to go here. There's the link, and it's in your book as well. So there's the link at the bottom to get you there. Thank you. So if we click on that link, we will come to something that looks like what you see there. But we're going to go ahead and go live to it. There we are. Thank you. So when you go to that website, you can scroll down, and you'll see the description of the competency framework, the description of the curriculum framework, the content areas, everything we've just talked about this afternoon. You can, the interrelationship, okay. Now the other neat thing is you can hover over, this left side is the competency framework, the right side is the curriculum framework. So if we hover, for example, over any of these domains or levels within the competency framework, we can look at those high level, level one competencies. We can click on the competency framework and look at those in, this, in the framework format. And again, these are the high level, level ones for more competencies. Here's a little clue. For more competencies, visit the curriculum framework. So let's do that. So this just gives you the high level competency framework. So if we go back, now we hover over the curriculum framework and you'll see that uh, here's that uh, simplified version of the framework. Again, if we kind of hover, we're going to see that different boxes pop up. But if we just click in general on, the, on this curriculum framework, so you can do that when you open it up. If it looks too big, just kind of uh, control net minus, and you can look at the whole thing if you want. But you can see, again, if we hover over any content area, it will show us, it will now show us level two competencies, or level ones and level twos. But more than that, we can drill down now. So let's pick one like, um, oh, uh, which one? Biosecurity. Bio that sounds like a trap. <laughs> well, let's just take, what is this? We usually do allergens, but let's do, uh, what is this? Biological, what area? Biological hazards, okay? So you pick a content area, you click on it. Now we can look at the, um, Content area definition. So definitions have been developed for every content area. We look at that broad level two competency and those level three competencies. Now it says additional competencies. So let's click on that. Now we can look, so there's our level twos and threes. Now we can look at the topic area, foundations, biological hazards of concern, growth factors. So those are the topic areas. Within each one of those topic areas now, we can look at the level fours and level five competencies. And if it's level six and sevens exist, they'll be there as well. In this case, it looks like we got down to level five, and that's about as far as we needed to go. So that's where you can look at all these competencies for all those topic areas within that particular content area. Okay? So that's where we find all the broad and narrow competencies. Now, if we look at, here, see this, take an assessment. That's where assessments can be loaded if we wanted to build some assessments right in on this page that someone could go to and be assessed against some of these if there was a written test or, or some sort of an online test. I think that area right now, as you can see, I can't click on it because we, nothing's been developed in terms of assessment. But let's look at courses for a second. So, so here we've drilled down within a content area. We see all the found all the competencies. Now let's click on course, say I'm a manager and I want to find out, okay, 
uh, my staff needs some of these competencies. What courses or what events or what can I do? So you click on that. Oh, well, here's the catalog. So right now we see that, uh, right now we have it populated with ORAU courses. So in this particular content area, here are some courses or treatments or learning events or whatever we have for that particular content area. And see this button here, submit courses. So if someone, let's say from, I don't know, some Canadian university, McGill, let's say, says, hey, I want to put my course into this content area, into the master framework for this content area, I'm going to submit a course. So they click on submit a course, they go in and create an account, and then they can upload their course information and show, how, show you know, the reviewers how that course is going to meet this, this content area. So anyone can submit a course, a university, a tra training provider, and they can get their course once it's reviewed. It'll go up on here in the inventory or in the catalog. Then if a course is placed within the curriculum, it will have a different designation. So not only will we have all the general courses and self-submitted courses from all providers, but if a course has actually gone through the review process and is now a part of the national curriculum, that will, it'll be designated as such. And then, let's say you want to take that course or want to get more information about that particular course or whoever the provider is, you would just go ahead and click on that course. Let's click on one and it'll take you to that provider of the course. And it could be anybody, but in this case it's going to be Compliance Wire because that was an FDA course. So you see how that works? So that kind of gets to Brian's question about how we're going to maintain this catalog. So we can have people self-submit, but then we can have courses identified that have been through the review process. Thank you, Gary. We're going we're to have to call it right there. And I think that's the end of my presentation anyway. So. <laughs> that worked out well.